This is going to be a hands-on workshop. If you guys want to play along, please uh, find a spot on a table. Um, if you'd rather just like sit over there and you know type on your lap, I'm totally fine with that too. Um, so it's up to you guys. Um, it's nicer to be up close just because you can collaborate and I can answer questions faster. Um, but again, it's really up to you and just go at your own pace. Um, so before I start, I want to give five minutes. So this is going to be like really, you know, pretty fast um, because I thought I had like a lot more time than I actually do. So um, I'm going to try to get through this as fast as possible. Um, so if you don't mind, please go to the website. Um, this is my GitHub account. There's a ton of old stuff out there, but just ignore that. Go to the Generative Art Repository, um, and you'll, there you'll see the resources that you need for today. All right, so again, if you just made it here, um, this is a hands-on workshop. You are welcome to pull out your laptops and go to uh, my, this link. It's my GitHub account. There's a repository with all the resources you need today. I'm going to, for five minutes, just um, wait till you guys get through that readme. It's really easy. It's just uh, really uh, installing, processing, and enabling Python mode. Everything else is pretty straightforward after that. So um, I'll just check in in three minutes and see where you guys are at. All right, where are we at? Are we almost set up? No? Okay, do you guys want me to walk you through it real quick? Yeah? Okay, let's do that. So go to processing.org. And um, go to download. Well, yeah. And then... Um, Donate later. I'm just going to do no donation because I've totally donated before. Just, you know, FYI. See, so click download, click the OS of your choice, and then um, once you have the application up, it'll look something like this, but it won't have code in it. And then this little drop down menu here, you're going to, it's going to say Java because it defaults to Java, and then you're going to add mode. 
And in the contribution manager, you're going to select Python and install that. Um, so um, we've got like two more minutes for setup. If you need help, raise your hand. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. If you are, um, you know, still setting up, uh, we'll just come back. I'm going to give a quick presentation and then it'll be more hands-on. So I'll just circle around again and uh, make sure that everyone's caught up, okay? All right. So let me get this slideshow started. I forgot how to do that. And... I'm sorry. Do you see it? Okay, so I'm gonna sit down because I can't like be like this um, while changing my slides. So I hope you all still see me. I'm pretty short. Uh, my adrenaline is in the roof. Like I uh, feel like it's over here, and then after I eat, it'll be like down here. So if you see me eating in slow motion in the corner after this, then um, you know just uh, bear with me. Anyway, uh, so I'm Alison Martinez Arocho, or how I like to say it, Alison Martinez Arocho. And um, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, and um, I moved to North Carolina six years ago and uh, completed a bachelor in science and computer science. Um, but I'm not a cat lady, I just have one. And then I'm also notorious for telling bad jokes, really bad jokes. So I was thinking, you know, maybe I could tell a joke during this presentation, maybe a joke about a pencil, but then I thought it was pointless. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Okay. So now, what is generative art? Who here has heard about generative art before? Okay, cool. And I also saw some uh, folks kind of, uh, so uh, one of the presenters yesterday, Cristian Medina, he did some like sort of generative art stuff. I don't know if you went to his talk, so that was pretty cool. And then um, I found out that a friend of mine, Jonathan over here, he also does generative art. Sorry to put you on the spot. Um, but, but yeah, so um, I'm glad that some of you know what it is. Uh, this is the best definition that I found out there. Um, and it's really any art practice where the artist creates a process that then somehow gets automated and in turn it turns into a work of art. And that was by uh, Philip Galanter. He's a NYU scholar. Oh, okay. I, I, I'm camera shy and he's telling me to move to the center uh, so that the camera can see me. Hi. Um, all right, so yeah, so this is a really good definition. I think it's, um, there's a lot of room for a lot of things to be considered generative art, which I love. Uh, and then these works here are examples of generative art. And um, these are actually made by a really good friend of mine. Her name is Irina Rindos. And I wanted to share those today because first of all, I don't like to plug my own art in a like, presentation, like that's kind of shady or something. But also because she has been doing this project where she's been doing art every day. And for one week, she decided, oh, I'm just gonna like 
play around with processing. And she came up with these things that look really cool to me. So um, this is kind of a little flavor about what's possible. So data-driven generative art. That is art that is created with processes that are informed by data, and that's what we're going to do today. We are going to be calling an API, getting some data, parsing through it, and then set up some rules, and then you know just make something happen. So actually, um, there was a preview. It's not like very visible here, but today we're going to do something pretty simple, just to get you know your um, get you to know the basics of processing and just do something fun. Um, so in the cover, you see like those little circles. That's what we're going to make today, like those lines and the different colors and everything. And um, I have the code for this, and we're going to trace it and kind of like mess with it. And um, that's really what we're going to do today. I just forgot to say that because, again, adrenaline. Um, so I already said this. And then this one was another awesome one that Irina did that I really wanted to share. Um, looks like a flower nebula or something, right? It's pretty cool. So really talented uh, software engineer and artist. OK, so processing. Processing is a pro programming language and a development environment. Um, Again, you have probably seen the site, processing.org. Um, it's also a community. Uh, so I think that you can share the works of art that you, can, that you have created. And I really like it because it's, it's really, it was really created for an interdisciplinary purpose. And it was to unite the arts with technology and the technology with the arts. And, um, that's pretty cool because, you know, like, I hate stereotypes, but you know how they say, like, oh, programmers, you know, they're not very visually um, good. I couldn't come up with a good adjective for that one. But, um, and that, you know, artists aren't that great at, like, science and logic things. And I, I don't think that's true. And I think that processing is a really good tool for people to experiment and realize that, they're really good at other things that they, you know, wouldn't think they would be or that people, you know, just like don't think they would be. So, okay. So, again, I'm trying to go really quick. If I'm going too fast, raise your hand and tell me to, you know, take a breather between slides or something. But um, let's keep going. So, APIs in a nutshell. It's really hard to explain APIs in one slide. <laughs> um, so I went with a picture. And really, it's an, a direct example of what we're going to do today. So um, we're going to make a GET request. And that's really what the only thing that we're going to be concerned about today. And I left like helpful links. If you want to learn more about APIs, um, you can go to codecademy.com slash APIs. It's really great. Um, website. It's free. You have to make an account, but it's still pretty cool. Um, so today, we are going to create a, an HTTP GET request. And we're going to use darksky.net, which is a really cool, powerful weather API. And um, we're going to add, well, really, what I did was, I didn't want you guys to have to sign up for darksky.net because you need an account for that. So I called it using my key and giving a, a, an arbitrary lat latitude and longitude, which just so happened that it was Bayamón, Puerto Rico, Engine 4, right? So um, we're going to get data from, like weather data from Bayamón at this particular point. Um, and then we're going to request. It's going to go to the server. And it's going to say, oh, you want weather data for Bayamong? OK. And then I'm, it's going to give us a response in JSON format. And um, again, links so that you guys can um, you know, explore. This, this link goes straight to the documentation. They have excellent documentation. So um, I encourage you guys to check it out. All right. So now we get to make art. So let's see. Um, we still have 20 minutes left. Well, a little less than that, but 
um, I think we're good. So now, who didn't get to set up? Raise your hand. Everyone set up. Okay. So um, let's go ahead and trace some code. It's pretty simple code. I tried to make it as simple as possible. Um, all right. Do you guys see that? Uh, Let's. Do you know how to zoom in on the command plus? Isn't that like on the browser? You can do it. Command shift plus. Ooh, won't do it. Good guess though. Okay. So anyway, you do you guys have this open on your laptops? Those of you with laptops. Yes. Raise your hand if you do. Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, let's try and get this uh, open for you. Uh, do you have it open, sir? Could you help her get her set up? Awesome. All right. So I hope you found it easy to set up. Um, processing was originally like a you know, Java-based programming language. And now it has some interfaces with like Ruby and JS and Python. And um, it's, it, it still needs some work. If you guys are looking for a cool open source project to contribute to, um, please contribute to processing. I think it's a great thing and Python's awesome. So um, I was kind of, I, I started using processing with Java and while I was translating my program, I was like, what, you can't do that? And um, made a note of it so that I can go back and maybe open a pull request. Um, but yeah, so I tried to be pretty straightforward in the code. And if you guys also have some uh, comments or would make some changes to it, just leave a comment on the repository. I'm happy to hear it. Uh, all right, so we're going to use three libraries, we're going to use urllib2 and json and random. And the first, so I defined two um, functions and then here these are necessary to run processing. So you need to have a setup to create kind of like your canvas for those of you that kind of mess with um, the image libraries in JS, and then you have something that draws. So let's go first to what we're going to be doing computationally here. Uh, and this is really get daily weather conditions is um, what calls the API and grabs our data. So we use URL lib2, and then I put in my, um, my version of what darksky.net gave me for by M1. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. Ah, it looks like that. But I have a cool add-on for Firefox that makes it look pretty. And then you can like expand and look at the actual contents of it better. So it gives you something that looks like this. And this is a whole bunch of data, right? And you, know, you can see what the weather conditions are currently. Um, it's mostly cloudy right now. And um, you can see it hourly and daily. And what I really wanted to look at it daily, and this seems about right, right? So um, it's rainy today. And it'll, do, it'll have eight days because it'll go from today to next Sunday. Uh, so it'll include today in that number. And um, so we're, I'm going to show you how to th traverse through this data. What I'm going to want to do is grab this icon value here. So we're going to receive all this glop. We're going to grab rain, and then we're going to create some rules based on that value to create art. So going back to the code. So then what we do is 
we get the response, and then we load the JSON so that it turns it into something we can manage, like um, Python dictionary. And then what we do is we say, oh, from the response that you got, I want the daily. And that's exactly what we saw over here. Maybe I can put this side by side. So we're here. We got this. We got all of this, and now at this point I'm saying, hey, I want to grab daily. So now in this variable, I have all the content inside daily, which is all this stuff. Um, All right, so um, now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be returning data. So data contains the forecast for the eight days. And I don't want summer, summary or icon up here because this is just like the general, I guess it's like the average forecast for the week um, or the mode or something. I'm not sure, but um, it was pretty weird to have like a daily rain when, you know, there's eight different values below. So, um, so what I'm returning right now is just what's inside data, and that's what this line is doing. And then for get color, I, I decided that I wanted to figure out which, which ones were um, printing out. So when I run this, like below here, I, I was printing out the the forecast, and I found that I only had like four items. So it's good practice to usually have a default in case you know someone changes the API and then um, you didn't add it in your dictionary and then you don't have a pretty color for it. Um, but I didn't do that here because I really just wanted to do a little proof of concept. So what I did was I created another dictionary on my own, and I said, hey, um, those four values that I have here that repeat over and over throughout the days, I'm just going to add a color to it. And these are hex values. And um, those I actually got from this website. It's a pretty cool website. Um, it's called colorhex.com. And it has really nice palettes. So I went to the palettes and found a nice blue one because it was going to be mostly rainy. I think it was this one. Um, but if you don't think about blue when it's rainy and maybe you just like to drink some wine or something, then maybe you could use ruby or something, right? So um, this is, there's, there's no wrong thing to do. I just went with blue because water seems blue sometimes. Anyway, so let's go back. Is that color dash palette? I'm sorry? Color dash palette? Yeah. Oh, yeah, and then the, the pages, color dash palettes. Um, I also, so if in the Slack channel, I posted my repository and the presentation is there and everything, so you'll have all the information there. Yeah, no problem. Um, all right, so going back. So then we have the setup. So those are things that I, those are like little helper functions that I created so that I could draw this and make it as simple as possible. Uh, the setup is just an 800 by 800 window or canvas. And then you can do like really fancy animation stuff with, um, with processing, but I don't want to do that. I just wanted a nice solid static image. Uh, so I said no loop. And then for alpha, I set a 100, which that kind of like sets the transparency for uh, everything that you put on there. And then I did a no fill because I didn't want like globby ellipses. I really wanted just the outline. And then for draw, this is where the fun stuff happens. I said, hey, I want my background to be black. And I then called my get daily weather conditions function that I just went through. And then I iterate through the days. Those are eight days that I'm, I'm going through. And then um, I'm setting up random numbers for the X and Y positions and random numbers for the width and height 
of the ellipses that I want to draw. So this is where I was printing um, the values and you see that I called the forecast and then I'm saying, hey, for each item in forecast, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want a, the icon. And that's where I get rain and partly cloudy, et cetera. And then when I'm ready to get the stroke and the color, I just get the color from my dictionary by calling this function. So what I do is I then call ellipse and ellipse takes four parameters the x and y position of the center of the circle, and then the width and the height of the diameter in pixels. And then um, the stroke, well, I just, <laughs> I just talked about that, but, but yeah, it then calls get color and gets the appropriate stroke depending on the value. And when you run that, you get something like that. And it's simple. What would you call that? I called it drizzly moments. But yeah, um, it's, it's relatively simple. The code is pretty straightforward. The most complex function I think here is maybe the parsing through the data and that's not even that bad. Um, I really now want you guys to pull this code up out and then um, mess with it. So I want to see, I want to see what you come up with. And then I have some recommendations and I can even like do some demos so that you can like be confident in what you're doing, but I'm sure you're all artists here. <laughs> I know you are. Yeah? Oh, okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right, well, I'm glad you, find it, you found it. Yes. Yes, definitely. So um, I don't want to say it off the top of my head in case I mess up, but a nifty little place to look at that would be in processing.org slash reference. There you'll see, actually, let's go to processing.py slash reference. <laughs> And um, there you'll find all the possible um, things that you can call and, and, and draw. Um, I think it's a stroke, stroke something, and then it takes a value in. Stroke weight, there it is. Yes, actually I don't think it matters. But they do it like that in the example, so if you want to test it, you can, but maybe, you know, if you want to do it the surefire way, then put it before. Cool. So um, let me go back to my presentation. I have some little recommendations here. So again, you can change the colors. Go to colorhex.com and find some new hex values to put into your circles. You can even change the shape. So if you go to processing.org um, slash reference, I mean pi.processing.org slash reference, you can see like there's primitives. They're pretty much the same. I mean, the only difference in the syntax from the regular one is a semicolon at the end. Um, but yeah, you can do triangles, you can do rectangles. Um, you can make them fill up, you can change the weights, you can do, like, there's so many possibilities. Um, but again, I wanted to get started with something pretty simple so that, I don't know, you guys end by the end of the day and kind of, you know, have a, have a cool piece of art that you created with code. I mean, that's pretty cool. So. If you do finish, then please uh, post it on the Gen Art channel or on General so that everyone else can see it. And um, now I'm going to turn this off and I'm going to go around and uh, help you guys out. We have like six more minutes. Cool?